now going to introduce our guest speaker. Our guest speaker today is Brett Kirschner. <laughs> How the Internet is Shaping the World We Are Building for Ourselves, Our Children, and Future Generations. And in this talk, he will address cyber abuse, artificial intelligence, and the social impacts of our digital environment. Brett is the Charles Widger Endowed Professor in Law, Business, and Economics at Villanova University and teaches at their law school. Brett is a renowned scholar in intellectual property and internet law and is an affiliated scholar of the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford Law School. Brett has published many books and articles and he has one in the back he's interested in selling if you'd like to buy it. And it's his most recent book he published in April of this year entitled Re-Engineering Humanity and it has received a great deal of attention and praise. Indiebound.org, a community of independent local book bookstores, described Brett's book in this way. This is a powerful analysis and it should be read by anyone interested in understanding exactly how technology threatens the future of our society and what we can do to make something better together. We are fortunate to have Brett speaking to us as he is a popular speaker at conferences in both the U.S. and internationally. He recently spoke at the University of Birmingham Future Fest. In June of this year, he was a panelist at the World Science Festival in New York City discussing the topic, Rethinking the Internet, How We Lost Control and How to Take It Back. He is also a frequent guest on popular podcasts and can be heard on WFMU-FM. So go look for it. I listen to it. It's a, real, it's a fascinating podcast. Today's talk will address whether the digital age is draining our humanity and causing us to be more robotic ourselves. How a host of technologies, including, including search engines, social networking, e-commerce, and wearable technology like the Fitbit affect us in subtle ways and shaping who we are and how we interact with each other and how we learn. Please welcome our special guest, Brett Christian, to the League of Women Voters. Can I use this? Yeah, I think so. All right. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm just going to say up, up front, I tend to talk fast, especially when I get excited. And I'm excited. So if I talk fast and you're like, I can't fuck, just raise your hand, wave, get my attention, and I'll, and I'll slow down. I'm happy to repeat what I said or explain things. Um, but I'm just, that's my sort of warning in, in advance. So I'm going to talk about how the internet's shaping the world we're building, how it's shaping who we can be, who our children can be, who uh, future generations can be. Um, back in 2012, I wrote a book about infrastructure and the social value of shared resources, things like the internet, but also things like roads, electricity, grid, basic research ideas, law. And I was very optimistic about the internet and the social value it creates for all of us. Um, and I still remain, in general, optimistic about what the internet can do and is doing and enabling us to do together. Um, yet, uh, earlier this year, after f six plus years of, of doing research and working on uh, this, uh, my next book project, Reengineering Humanity, uh, is a bit more pessimistic about some of the digital network technologies that the internet enables, built on top of the internet, not always relying on the internet. And so that's what I'm going to talk about with you guys today. All right, yes, this is working, cool. All right, so many science fiction stories. Any fans of science fiction out there? Anyone like to read science? Okay, enough of you. So many science fiction stories pit humans versus machines. Sometimes the machines are tools of powerful humans that oppress everyone else. Sometimes the machines become the oppressors, right? They become sentient, they take over. Often humans unwittingly sow the seeds of their own destruction 
by madly rushing down a technological path attracted by the siren's call of efficiency, optimization, and perfection, only to learn too late that along the way they've lost something, their humanity. So what if we were rushing down such a path? Would we know? How would we be able to distinguish reality from science fiction? After all, think about it. If someone had written a book in 1960 that perfectly, accurately described the world we're currently living in, it would undoubtedly have been science fiction when written. Right? Think about it. It would have been regarded as incredible fantasy. Some readers would have understood it as utopian. Others as dystopian. It completely depends, of course, on the reader's own values and conception of what the good life and a good society would be. So what matters, what's relevant to our actual lives and plans are the underlying concerns about the society we choose to build and sustain for ourselves, our children, and for future generations. So my book with Evan Selinger, who's a philosopher of technology, uh, my book with Evan is not science fiction. But it takes very seriously the idea that many technologies currently deployed and being developed deserve more careful attention precisely because of their potential to reconstruct humans and society on an unprecedented scale and scope. So humans have been shaped by technology since the dawn of time. And of course humans have even shaped other humans through technology for a lo very long time as well. And many people have written about this and thought deeply about it. But the techno-social engineering of humans exists on an unprecedented scale and scope. And it's only growing more pervasive as we embed networked sensors in our public and private spaces, and in the devices we carry, in our clothing, and for some folks, uh, on themselves or in themselves. It's the fine-grained, hyper-personalized, ubiquitous, continuous, and often environmental aspects of the techno-social engineering that make the scale and scope unprecedented. So here are the, 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 the basic, oh, wrong direction. Here are the basic, uh, I will eventually learn how to manage this remote. Uh, here are the basic themes in our book. When does technology diminish our humanity? When and how do we become programmable? Can we detect what happens? How are we going to evaluate it? What makes us human? What matters about being human? Like science fiction, public discourse on these themes are often split among utopian and dystopian perspectives. And both perspectives, not surprisingly, tend to be dismissive of the other. Right? So you've got tech boosterism versus Luddites pining for the old days. But technology and humanity are abstract and complex. These, these themes aren't actually easy to discuss and evaluate. There's definitional obstacles. Evidence is non-existent because we don't know what exactly to measure, much less how to evaluate we, what we in fact see. So re-engineering humanity engages with these fundamental questions in a fresh and intellectually rigorous manner. It aims to hit a lay audience. It's, aimed, it's very rigorous as an academic book and at the same time, Part of the reason I teamed up with Evan to write this was we wanted to make it accessible to everyone. So here, here's, the, here's the table of contents. Don't dwell on this for too much. Oh, there it is. Let's see. Oh. Maybe I've got to just... All right, there's the table of contents. Um, we cover a lot of ground. I, I can't possibly talk about this in a day, much less in 45 minutes. Uh, but I want to give you some of this, just give you a sense of the scope. Like I want to talk about Turing tests and how we can actually figure out when we're becoming more machine-like. But it's in there. Um, I'm going to highlight a few key ideas. I chose a few different key ideas that I want you to walk away with. And some of those ideas are generalizable. I'll give you some specific examples. I think you can think what I'm saying, what, what Frischman said about Fitbits and activity watches in schools applies to lots of the other technologies you may encounter. Okay. But I want to say up front, I'm happy to open up the discussion widely, as widely as you'd like in the q and I'm actually happy to stick around and talk with folks afterwards if they want to. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do first is run through a couple of familiar examples just to give you a sense what I mean by techno-social engineering of humans, because that's an admittedly academic bit of jargon. 
And I, t I thought about excising it from my talk, but I didn't because it matters. The, 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 the term captures a lot of meaning even though it's academic jargon. So what I'm going to try to do is give you some examples that you can refer to. Um, all right, let's keep I'm giving up on this. All right. Um, here's, here, I'm going to talk about some examples. Uh, and then, um, this is your talk. <laughs> then I'm going to talk about three related topics. Um, first, I want to give you a sense of the scale and scope of the problem. And so I'm going to explain how humanity's techno-social dilemma is analogous to climate change. That's the best metaphor for thinking about the problems we face. Second, I'm going to talk about fitness tracking in schools. It's an example that highlights some of the important concepts that we can extend to many other digital network technologies. It also allows me to tell you a personal story. And then third, I'm going to explain why one of the foundational constitutional questions of the 21st century is whether and how society can sustain our freedom to be off, our freedom to be free from techno-social engineering itself. Put more simply, I want to explain why we need to leave some room for Luddites. We all need to practice a little bit of Luddism in our lives. I have actually an op-ed or a short piece coming out in Scientific American, I think, next week with that title, Leaving Room for Luddites. All right, so a couple of, a couple of examples. Um, let's consider a few examples from your everyday life of techno-social engineering. Uh, so have you ever clicked uh, and I agree a button and accepted the terms without of an online contract that you didn't bother reading. Anyone raise your hand? Anyone done that? Like today? Yesterday? Recently? Right? We all have. I do. Right? We do it all the time. These contracts, and more importantly, the human computer interface through which they're presented to us are designed so that there's no point in reading the fine print. Okay? There's no point in reading it, much less stopping and thinking about whether the legal relationship you're forming or the third parties lurking in the background are trustworthy. Right? It's a rather simple user experience. See it? Click it. Stimulus response. Perfectly rational stimulus response by design. What's really interesting, I think, we have a whole chapter about this, but what's really interesting about the example is how click to contract interfaces creeps. It creeps across contexts from websites to apps on your phone to smart TVs and to most likely every other supposedly smart device we'll soon see when the, what's called the Internet of Things arrives. When your smart home with all of its devices is linked up these contexts, the legal relationships, the data exchanged are so, and so on are so dramatically different, yet the engineered stimulus response remains the same. See it? Click it. Follow the script. So have you ever been in a social, social situation which you just couldn't help but check your phone? You do so because you just can't help yourself. Fear of missing out? What might happen? That's addiction by design. There's nothing worse than when a family member, a friend, or a colleague sits down for a meal and they plop their smartphone on the table. Not only for what it says about their own attention, but what it says about how they think about you. Sherry Turkle at MIT has a wonderful book about how uh, it changes the nature of conversations. It's really worth reading. Her book. Um, all right, well, you know, there's, there, then there's social media. This is a, another Scientific American piece that uh, co-author Catherine Hensch and I wrote recently about how Facebook programmed our relatives. Even ever find yourself habitually using superficial expressions that the interface promotes? Clicking like, retweet, or heart instead of formulating your own thoughtful response? We all have. And that's because social media platforms are optimized to get users to communicate in a particular fashion. The platforms profit from a particular style of communication. The techno-social engineering on social media platform isn't fully responsible for our fake news jam or reality jamming problems, but they do play a significant role. Now, people aren't stupid or lazy. I mean, 
I should take it back. We're all stupid or lazy. I'm stupid or lazy about a lot of things. My wife tells me that all the time, and it's true. We're stupid and lazy about different things in our lives. But people aren't stupid or lazy for believing fake news. That's a meme, that's a weird, that's a meme in the discourse that's a weird form of victim blaming. And it's really a distraction. The platforms are designed to discourage critical thinking, deliberation, or leaving the platform to dig deeper or check credible sources. Beyond how we think or how we relate to each other, some social media platforms have experimented with engineering human emotions. So a famous or possibly infamous, depending on your perspective, the, the paper published by the, in the proceeding of the National Academy of Science presented experimental evidence of massive scale emotional contagion through social networks. I'm happy to discuss the details in Q&A, but suffice it to say that a firestorm, it developed, and then it died out, as is often the case. So we dig into these and many other examples that reveal how powerful tech, this is what I mean by techno-social engineering, powerful techno-social engineering is occurring everywhere. It reconfigures so many of our lived-in environments. So I should say, I often use this to say, I'm, more I'm not as interested in intelligent machines. I'm interested in engineering unintelligent humans. So I'm more interested in how the use of the technology affects the behavior between this father and, and daughter than I am about replacing waiters with, with uh, automated robots. Both are important. It's just my focus is on the human side of the line, not the robot side of the line. But it's not just these, you know, these early 20th century Taylorism highlighted the workplace. It's crept into our homes. One extreme scenario, which I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about today, but one extreme scenario that's worth having in your mind is, is that smart programming of the future will require us to automatically accept the shots, the shots that algorithms call. It's a simple extension of the click to contract script. Perhaps the only way we'll be able to do all the things that the smart systems managing our lives require us to do will be for us to accept a new lot in life, and that's to behave like simple machines. That's the dark side. It's not the inevitable side, but it's the dark side of 21st century techno-social engineering. So back in March, uh, the New York Times, The Guardian, and many other major newspapers broke this story. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, the Cambridge Analytica story. In case you're not familiar with it, Cambridge Analytica is a political data firm hired by President Trump's 2016 election campaign uh, and by others, it, other, it had other clients. Uh, it gained access to private information on more than 50 million Facebook users. The private information, uh, the firm offered tools based on that private information that could identify, it, it's, it claimed, the personalities of American voters and influence their behavior. So it's developing personality profiles and then saying you can target ads and other things based on them. So many folks accuse Cambridge Analytica of theft. They stole our data! No, it's not that. It's not theft. They didn't steal anything. That's not quite right. Cambridge Analytica collected data pursuant to its contracts with Facebook. And Facebook essentially brokered the deals and enabled the data to flow. And got paid. And got paid, sure. Yeah. There's a temptation to focus on the Cambridge Analytica debacle and react to it. Stop Cambridge Analytica, it's the bad actor, let's go get them. This is a very typical reaction it's incredible, that's incredibly short-sighted. After all, there are hundreds or thousands of similarly situated companies leveraging the Facebook platform to collect data and use it to develop intelligence, actionable intelligence. So that might lead one to diagnose the problem as a Facebook problem. We should regulate Facebook, some say. And in fact, there's a strong push in that direction. Some say we should just boycott Facebook. Everyone should just delete their Facebook accounts. This movement may make sense for some, but not for most. At least not now. I'll come back to this near the end of the talk, but simply put, billions of people around the world use Facebook to socialize, maintain connections, organize groups, get politically active, etc. We need better alternatives first. The possibility that Cambridge Analytica engineered beliefs and votes through its use of Facebook may be scary. Now in reality, Cambridge Analytica by most accounts is not actually that effective. 
but it's the, it's the possibility that they could be that some other similar, similarly situated entity was. It can be scary. But bear in mind that both Cambridge Analytica and Facebook are symptomatic of our diseased technosocial environment. Facebook is just one of many big tech companies on the internet that participate in surveillance capitalism, that collect data about you. You are, in a sense, a consumer, but you're also the product. We could talk instead about Google or Amazon or eBay or any other, any other number of big tech companies, large companies, but of course there are millions of smaller ones too. Digital network technologies are re-engineering our planet, our social systems, and our very selves. We need to think at a different scale. After all, what we're really talking about, again, go back to the title of the talk, is the world we're building for ourselves, our children, and future generations. To examine the interconnected, global, environmental, and intergenerational considerations, and at the same time, and it's hard, but at the same time, connect those connect considerations to our everyday lives, the best metaphor, I think, is climate change. So here's one way to understand climate change. We want energy. We need energy. Energy is an essential input to so many of our modern activities. Now we can build different supply systems for energy, but the one we've relied on over the past century is heavily dependent upon burning fossil fuels. It need not be. There are alternative sources of energy, but fossil fuels have been relatively cheap, convenient, and politically supported for past and current generations. The massive external costs from burning fossil fuels are not felt by past or current generations. The costs are largely pushed, pushed onto future generations. Now, while blame may be cast upon fossil fuel companies, those big bad fossil fuel companies, and it should be, we all bear some of the responsibility for climate change. As hard it is to stomach and understand, it is true especially those of us in the United States and other developed countries who've consumed so much. But keep in mind, our heavy dependence on fossil fuel consumption has been economically rational. We all make countless individually and incrementally cost-benefit justified decisions in our daily lives advantaged by cheap and convenient fossil fuel consumption. It's a massive global tragedy of the commons. Dealing with climate change is politically and economically difficult because it requires significant structural changes, adjustments in how we live our lives, and cultural and various other systemic adaptations. As Evan and I argue in Reengineering Humanity, the digital networked environment summers from a very similar tragedy. We want, among other things, to connect, to communicate, interact, transact, and otherwise engage with each other nearly instantaneously and often without regard for geographic location. There are huge benefits to doing so. Digital network technology like energy is essential. It's an essential input into so many of our modern activities. Every day, each of us make various decisions about technology that seem on their own terms rational and unproblematic. We adopt technology and mindlessly bind ourselves to the terms and conditions offered. We follow the scripts written and paths set by platform designers. We carry wear and attach devices to ourselves and our children, maintaining a connection and increasing our dependence. We outsource thinking, because heck, there's always an app for that. Each decision may be cost-benefit justified and rational, yet the net effect on who we are and the lives we're capable of leading may un be unjustifiable. Nothing less than our humanity is at stake. We risk being engineered to behave like predictable and programmable people. You've got to ask yourself, is that the life you want to live, you want your children to live, you want future generations to have in front of them? It's too easy to blame the companies that treat us like programmable objects through hyper-personalized technologies attuned to our personal histories, our present behaviors and feelings, and predicted futures. They do bear substantial responsibility, but so do all of us. 
And so now I'm going to switch gears to Fitbits. I'm going to switch gears to Fitbits. I'm going to switch gears to fitness trackers. It's an example of self-tracking, or what some people call the quantified self. And it's an example where we treat ourselves and our children as predictable and programmable objects. It doesn't depend on the internet, by the way. It can happen you know, without having an internet connection. All right, so I'm going to discuss two examples, one of which received a ton of press coverage and another that draws from my own personal experience. I'm going to use the cases to illustrate a straightforward and important point. Beware the trappings of technology-enabled Taylorism, by which I simply mean the ever more effective and efficient scientific management of human beings. And we should be especially wary of this in our schools. So let's begin with the Oral Roberts University controversy. Uh, it's, if it sounds familiar, it's because that's the one that got a lot of attention. My personal story didn't. Um, so freshmen at Oral Roberts are required to purchase and wear a Fitbit health tracker to participate in phys ed. It tracks the number of steps they take each day. It reveals whether they maintain 150 minutes of elevated heart rate every week. The tracked activity fit factors into their education grade, apparently accounting for something like 20%. And student, keep in mind that students are required to take the class every semester while they are at the university. So essentially that means they're required to wear Fitbits throughout their undergraduate experience. Now commentators, when they heard of this, criticized it and others defended it. Some focused on the creepiness factor, right? They argued, you know, the university is intruding too deeply into the lives of its students. But beyond the visceral response, commentary tended to invoke standard privacy concerns. Who gets what data? What can they do with it? How long is the data stored? How effective are the security measures? Has informed consent taken place? All very important step questions. I, well, I teach privacy. It's all very important. But maybe it's overblown. After all, these issues can be handled. Have students sign the informed consent form, provide them with the adequate answers to all those questions, and give them an opportunity to opt out. In fact, that's what Oral Roberts has done. So tracking student activities, one of the things that all schools do prior to Fitbits being introduced, Oral Roberts already tracked students' physical activity as part of its phys ed program. It relied on a different tracking technology. Students recorded statistics by hand. This satisfied some folks. So, for example, an uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation member stated that the Oral Roberts Fitbit requirement isn't really a problem unless it gathers geolocation data. Fitbit's just a more efficient means for gathering the same type of data that it always collected. What, what are you all worried about? Seen this way, so long as the Fitbit program doesn't alter existing privacy norms, then all those critical reactions and perceptions of creepiness are overblown. In my view, this demonstrates how conventional privacy analysis is necessary but insufficient. It's not enough. It falls woefully short. It obscures, in fact, a host of deeper issues that need to be evaluated. So if this example is not resonating, I'm sorry, but bear in mind that everything I say about it, you can apply to some other technology. It applies to other technologies as well. And I can, we can come back and talk about that in Q&A. But it's important, what I want to do, I want to like, enable you to do to think, this is what I do with my students when we talk about this in class, is I want you to compare, be able to compare the available tools used to surveil the students and think about how they affect users. Now there's a wide range of different tracking tools we might think about and examine. Let's just stick with what they used, a handwritten journal and a Fitbit. Okay, so students who record their daily activities in a journal take a number of steps that require time and effort, planning and thinking. Right? Students engage with themselves in a reflective manner. They have to think about what they've accomplished and where they've fallen short. Using value-based judgment, they need to determine what should they record. I would argue this is a humanizing process. It revolves around basic human capabilities, self-reflection, and awareness that can be linked in essential ways to free will and autonomy. Even deeper considerations that matter about being human. I can elaborate on that in Q&A if people want, but for now the point is simply that the act of recording takes time and effort and requires human judgment. 
Whereas some tracking tools require users to have skin in the game, to engage themselves, to exercise judgment, others by contrast do not, or do so to a much lesser degree. Studies make the same basic point with respect to taking notes in class by hand rather than by typing. So this is why I ban laptops in my classes, at least for the first third of the semester, and then we talk about why. Handwriting class notes require students to exercise judgment about what's worth recording because they can't record everything. Unless they're a stenographer, right? But most aren't. And so it, 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 it uh, it appear, they can't record everything, so it appears to lead to greater comprehension according to the various studies, at least with respect to conceptual knowledge. Um, but let's compare, let's stick with the tracking technology, let's go back to tracking technology from the laptops, right? Um, the knowledge that recorded data will be given to someone else places students in a position to engage with another basic capability, the capacity to relate to others. So it's not just self-reflection and awareness, it's also about how I relate to others. So in exercising judgment about what to record, students also consider how others will perceive them and how they wish to be perceived and understood. Right? So you might worry, but they have to think about, think about themselves from an external vantage point, in other words. They have to think about how their professor or their instructor is going to see them, but also maybe their peers if the data is shared in some phys ed setting. Now you might worry that giving students such freedom would tempt them to behave unethically because deception becomes an, op an option. The reported activity data could be fudged in the hopes of getting a better grade. Right? So should a student report 21 minutes of jogging as 21 minutes or they round down to 20? Do they exaggerate and report 25 or 30? Right? The decision may vary based on an assessment of the anticipated audience uh, and how they want to be perceived and understood. Now we are, I would argue, that overemphasizing accuracy, truth-telling, and efficiency in data collection is dangerously myopic. It only, it, it only accounts partially for what matters, and it casts an unduly negative light on the value of students actually making decisions for themselves. Part of what it means to relate to others is to make decisions about how we want to represent our accomplishments and failures, how we feel about matters that affect how they feel about us. It's part of being human. So you probably have lots of examples you can think of. We all do this when we interact socially with each other. So I'll give you an example. When I lived outside of New York City, I'm going to admit this, don't tell anyone, but I used to lie. I used to exaggerate. I, I would understate the average length of my commute, partly to make myself feel better, and partly to suggest to others that I was better off than I actually was. Right. Or think about the judgment involved when responding to someone who comes late to an appointment and says, how, how long have you been waiting? Whatever numeric answer you give, I just got here, it's been half an hour, etc., will depend less on, typically will depend on less on numeric accuracy. No one's like, oh, it's exactly, let me check my watch, I've been here for 27 minutes. Right? No, it's, it's much, typically it's more about how, the relationship you have with the person, whether you want to shame them or not, whether you care, how you want them to feel for being late. Right? I'm sure you could think of lots of other examples. Let's go back to fitness tracking. The main point I'm making is that requiring students to record their daily activities in a journal is humanizing because it pushes them to practice these basic capabilities. I've shown my hand. The Fitbit doesn't require students to engage with themselves or others in the same way as the analog tools. In fact, it does the opposite. Right? It greatly improves the efficiency of data collection, in large part by eliminating human involvement. By eliminating their role in data collection, students become passive objects and are no longer participating subjects. Of course, they can still learn about themselves if, for example, big if, they eventually gain access to the collected information, they can interpret it and understand it and use it. In other words, if they become active data users. But my main argument is that much like workers in a Taylorist factory, students enrolled in the Fitbit version of physical education are being treated as passive objects and losing opportunities to practice essential skills and develop basic human capabilities. Now you might doubt, some certainly do, that fitness tracking tools are really the main ones we use to develop the skills of self-reflection, judgment, and sociality. Indeed, there are so many other opportunities in life to develop these skills and capabilities. So why worry about digital self-tracking device? Well, the simple answer is what we do with these tools is congruent with what we do with 
other techno-social engineering tools. Right? The Fitbit is just one of many ed tech tools that share common features. And so we make the same kinds of observations in the book about other ed tech tools, but also about things outside of the education context. Now, if we were to do a more complete analysis of this, we'd step back, we'd shift focus from the artifact used to collect data, that is the, the journal and the Fitbit, and we think about the broader technological system within which these tools are just a node. We'd have to consider the full range of inputs, outputs, activities, agents, points of control within the system, and the relevance of defaults, and the fact that we're talking about the educational setting where educational institutions, the schools, are the accepted authority that set the default that most people follow most of the time. The school is exercising control. They're the trusted entity. The shift from student to university to student to university and various others, like Fitbit and advertisers and other potential third parties, is significant. It's remarkable. But we don't have analysis for it, time for analysis today. But I want you to consider one thing. Just consider how the seemingly simple, efficient, and effortless data collection with the Fitbit only seems simple to the student. There's in fact a much more complex system involved. It's just hidden with a wider range of potential actors and uses of the collected data. Regardless of how in fact the Oral Roberts program happens to operate, I don't want to get caught up on like, oh, Oral Roberts is this way or that way. The point is, this type of system has a bunch of hidden third parties involved in the system. It just seems simple to the, sub, to the object, the human who's being treated like an object. This leads to the second obscured problem that I would, I would argue generalizes to lots of technology. And it's surveillance creep. Okay, so surveillance creep can take lots of different forms. It can be the gradual expansion of surveillance from one context to another. We surveil in this, in the classroom, and then we do it on the playground, and then we do it in the hallways, and then we do it outside of the school. We change the context, we, can, we extend the practice. Or it could be the gradual expansion of the types of data collected in a particular context. Uh, we'll just start with physical activity, and then we'll think about mental activity, and then we'll think about biometric, and then we'll think about emotional state. All in the same context, but you start with one, get used to it, and you move on to the next. Or it could be the gradual expansion of the use of the data, or the third parties with whom data is shared. Usually when people talk about surveillance creep, or they think about it, they envision something happening on the side of those doing the surveillance. It's the NSA. It's Facebook, they're, they're doing the creeping. They're creepy, and they're creeping. But it can also happen on the other side. Most people don't think about this, but I want you to think about it. I want people to think about it generally. It happens on the other side. As those being surveilled become accustomed to it, as their beliefs and preferences about surveillance technology more generally are shaped through their experience. Educationally mandated surveillance programs do much more than get students accustomed to using digital technology for self-tracking. The programs get students in the habit of submitting that data to third parties who can exercise authority and who may have agendas that diverge from their own. The programs normalize, they make normal, and they get people used to an arrangement that occurs in non-educational contexts too. They got insurance companies wanting customers to provide them with all kinds of self-tracking data to set rates, or think about the employment sector and wellness programs, or, or you know, where these kinds of programs are growing and creeping and, per and pervasive. Surveillance in the educational sector, though, remains especially important because schools are powerful sites of techno-social engineering. Schools shape us. Generation after generation. So I would look at the Oral Roberts example and understand it as just a puzzle piece, a step along a path. And so I want to uh, give you a second piece, a step that occurs much earlier in the path. One might say at the beginning of the educational assembly line. So suppose, oh, I may have had slides, I'm skipping. I kind of got caught up in the talk. Um, yeah. So uh, suppose the digital tracking wasn't conducted by college students and instead was assigned in a public elementary school. Would your views about its significance change? We might be comfortable presuming that college students are discriminating tool users, but it seems a stretch for elementary school kids. A few years ago, my first grader came home after school very excited. 
Dad, Dad, I won. I mean, I was picked. I got a new watch. That's great. What happened? He quickly rattled something off about being the, one of the kids in his class who was selected to wear a new watch for gym class. So a day or two later, I got the following letter. I know that the text is blurry and uh, you probably can't read it, but I don't know what else to do. There's the, le there's the letter. And I want you, you know, so to the extent that you can read it, think about your reaction. I, I you know, I, I typically say like, react before I tell you my reaction, because my reaction was atypical. And at least in my community in New Jersey where I lived, when I read the letter, I went ballistic. I started pulling the hair out. That's why I'm folding up here. It's all because of this event. Um, you, know, I, you know, at first I wondered about all the standard privacy issues. Who, what, when, where, why, and, and for what purpose are they collecting, sharing, using, and storing data about kids? The letter didn't even vaguely suggest that parents and their children could opt out, much less that consent was required. But even if it had, informed consent couldn't exist because there were, all those questions were unanswered. I also wondered, had the school gone through some form of institutional review board, IRB process? Had someone thought about the ethics of what they were doing? The answer is no. I read the letter again, and I got stuck on this line. Maybe this will be less blurry. Yeah. So I, I read the letter again. This is what I got stuck on. Seriously? Bath time and bedtime surveillance. The letter made me think of one of those Nigerian bank scam emails that goes straight into my spam folder. Such trickery! I remembered how my son had come home, so excited, the smile on his face, the joy in his voice. It was worse than an email scam. They would worked him deeply, getting him hooked. He was so incredibly happy to have been selected to be part of this new fitness program, to be a leader. How would a parent not be equally excited? Almost everyone was that I talked with, but not me. And it actually led to, and I can do this in Q&A, we can talk about it more, but it led to an incredibly long conversation where I actually think it, it was a great moment for the two of us. He ended up being someone who went to school and was convincing some of his friends to not, you, not join the program, so it was, it was great. <laughs> I was very, very proud. On his own. Like, I didn't say you have to or don't have to. I just said, what do you think you should do? And then we talked about the, the advantages and disadvantages. It was, it was pretty amazing. What I did, I contacted someone at the PTA. I spoke with the supervisor of health. I wrote a letter to the super di uh, school super, uh, district superintendent. I eventually had some meetings with the general counsel. What caught people's attention, I think, was a line from the letter I sent. It said, I'll quote real quick, uh, quote, I have serious concerns about this program and worry that the school district hasn't fully considered the implications of implementing a child surveillance program. <laughs> no one had called it a child surveillance before. All of a sudden, the creepiness of bedtime and bath time surveillance sunk in. And, and quite naturally, it, con it triggered what is always considered, where, which are the conventional privacy concerns. The word surveillance generated a visceral reaction. That was effective, I guess, for getting people to stop and think. Up to that point, no one seemed to have done so. But for a number of obvious and fair reasons, the program is like so many being adopted across school districts across the country. It's well-intentioned to deal with obesity, right? Uh, it's uh, aimed at, you know, the real problem of obesity or lack of fitness. It's financed. The Department of Education would have these PEP grants to finance these kinds of programs. Financed in an age of incredibly limited and shrinking budgets. It ele it's elevated by the promise that accompanies every new technology. People trust the school district and they love technology. The Activity Watch program presents substantial upside with little apparent downside. So it seems like an easy cost-benefit analysis. For most people, it seemed like a rare win-win-win. But to be on, I'll be honest, I, you know, I tried to intervene, very little changed. Better disclosure, a little bit of you know, informed consent they thought would fix everything. Once more, I would argue the conventional privacy concerns, while very important, fall woefully short. The most pernicious aspect of the program, in my mind, was not the 24-7 data collection, nor was it the lack of informed consent, though I would argue those things matter a lot, so don't mis misunderstand. The deepest concern for me is the unexamined techno-social engineering of children. 
It appears no one thought about how the program shaped the preferences of a generation of children and their parents, to be honest, to accept without question or concern a 24-7 wearable surveillance device that collects and reports data to others. It just became normalized. We should expect creep, both within the schools and beyond. In the book, we talk about extensions of this program. We set up a hypothetical, or what philosophers call thought experiments, right? So we imagine, what, imagine you're at the school board and they have these extensions. We've gotten used to the fitness tracking. Let's do, let's do mental activity tracking, because then we can know who's being attentive in class, and when they're not, we can get them you know, to pay attention when they should be paying attention. And hey, maybe we can, we can have personalized learning programs that are attuned to what's going on in the neural maps that we're getting of their brains. And when people's emotions, when people are feeling sad, the teacher can intervene. These are hypotheticals when we wrote the book, but no longer. Those technologies are being deployed. They exist. Let's just hope this doesn't become normal, normalized. The padlock. Pavlovian response. We'll get you with a shock to do as you should. All right, so again, I could go on and on about this, as you can probably. This exists. Yeah, padlock exists. You can get one. If you want to change your own behavior, like, I will not eat carbs, as I was talking to people before, I'm on a low carb diet. Shock! Oh, that cookie looks so good. No! <laughs> you know, I can train my, I can train myself, or I can be trained by others. We let ourselves be trained. Anyway, yes, it tells you exactly what it is, and yet, anyway. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna shift gears one more time. So, uh, I think this is right. Yeah. So this is a piece coming out, a short piece coming out in Science of American, I think, in the next week or two, uh, called "Leaving Room for Lights." Um, but I was recently called a light, and it was meant to be an insult, you know, suggest that I was this anti-technology zealot, and I resisted the temptation to sort of defend my pro-tech cred, I mean, my son, my son codes, I'm, I'm an engineer, like, I program, I, I like technology, but I didn't, instead I explained the importance of lights as a counterbalance to smart tech utopianism. Traditional Luddism involves breaking technology or refusing to participate in socio-technical systems. Why bother? Why, why would one do that? Well, for some, it's political resistance to disruptive technological innovation that threatens an existing way of life. That's, how, that's the, probably the, the better characterization of what the Luddites were actually doing uh, in the uh, you know, uh, early in the 19th century, 20th century, early, yeah, 19th century. So another, for some, for others, it's an ethical response to the ways in which the technology affects personal or social relationships. In 1977, Langdon Winter went further, he defended what he called epistemological Luddism, which basically means according to him, de decommissioning, dismantling, or importantly, I think for our purposes, withdrawing from a socio-technical system precisely for the purpose of learning about it, and more importantly, about how it affects individuals and society. So Luddism, I would argue, enables critical reflection and evaluation of the world we've built in our building. At times, we need to break away, to deconstruct the system within which we find ourselves embedded and that they're hard to escape, and to evaluate how the technologies we take for granted influence who we are and who we can be. This is why Luddism is important for society on the whole. We all should practice some Luddism in our lives. I'm not saying we should destroy the IT systems at work, insist everyone write memos in cursive on yellow pads or etch them into stone tablets. That's not what Luddism involves anyway. I'm calling for people to exercise their freedom to be off, and while doing so, to reflect on and evaluate the relationships to the digital network technologies they left behind. Digital detox, as some have called it, can be a powerful eye-opener, provided you're open to reflecting on the experience. After recovering from device withdrawal, detoxers begin to recognize uh, substantial patterning influence that the digital tech has had on the character of their lives. So it's a powerful means for individuals to reevaluate the relationship to technology. But implicit, here's the political gist of it, right? The implicit in calls for digital detox 
is the idea that there is a practically exercisable freedom to be a Luddite. And it's worth considering what the structural preconditions for such a freedom might be. Power and environmental conditions matter. As two scholars, Lackney and Dotson, acknowledge in a recent piece about Luddism, quote, rarely do individuals have any substantive say regarding the technologies that come to shape their lives. They act within larger socio-technical structures that are not of their choosing, end quote. What they mean, might be relevant for our talk, is people may choose the brands and the features of the tech. They may sell it, and we celebrate the modern consumerist cornucopia that e-commerce delivers. But autonomy often falters when people consider withdrawal. Modern society demands constant connection and participation, which makes practicing Luddism increasingly difficult. Foregoing Facebook, as I mentioned before, invites social isolation. Leaving messages unattended risks frustrating bosses, spouses, and about everyone else. Being disconnected means missing out or being out of sync with fast-moving memes and social discourse. It is, of course, notoriously difficult to evaluate empirically the degree to which social pressures determine our tech, tech adoption and use, because the technological and the social seem to be inseparable. This is why Ed and I focus on techno-social engineering of humans, my buzzword I keep coming back to in the book. The always on, the always on world we're building involves techno-social engineering of both our lived in and experienced environments, whether it's our homes, our offices, or just you know, our space, public spaces, um, and ourselves, our humanity, simultaneously. Who we are and are capable of being inextricably intertwined with our built world. So, to protect Buddhism, we need to engineer environments that sustain our freedom to be off, to escape. So, this, this is a quote from the book, where we, near the end of the book, where we talk about a world where and the engineered world determines a, uh, a world where we become fully predictable and programmable people is one in which we're performing our lives, we're following scripts. They may be efficient, but they, they may leave much to be desired. This kind of world, in our view, would be quite tragic. So we need to sustain our freedom to escape or to be off. Now, I want to be clear. Being a Luddite doesn't mean abandoning digital tech cold turkey. It's very easy, and so people do it, to tell people, just stop using this or that tech. You know, delete Facebook, stop using GPS, ban your smartphone. But for many people, most of the time, these suggestions are not practical because their current lifestyles and a host of economic, cultural, and technological dependencies. So again, I'm going to return to Cambridge Analytica for a second. In the wake of the Cambridge Analytica debacle, there, was, there is a strong movement to just delete your Facebook accounts. Now, some folks enjoy the freedom to do so. Most simply don't. Suppose 1,000 or even 100,000 people will delete their Facebook accounts. So what? The overwhelming majority of people are, that are active Facebook users will not because they cannot, at least not yet. Many depend on Facebook to maintain their connections with family and friends abroad, to organize events, to interact with coworkers, until alternatives for accomplishing those ends are available and people see and experience how they can get on without the tech they depend on, quitting cold turkey just isn't going to happen. Of course, extreme, extreme prescriptions make for good media. They sell a lot of books, but deletion isn't a serious solution. Digital tech companies themselves are marketing their own, quote, solutions. Apple's screen time in iOS uh, 12, Google's digital well-being for Android, hundreds of productivity apps designed to help you curb your smartphone addiction. The basic mantra underneath it all is that there's an app for that. Right? It naively assumes and worse, perpetuates the erroneous but comforting belief that our problems are fundamentally computational problems for which more data, more data and better algorithms is the best solution. This digital tech solutionism only reinforces our dependence on supposedly smart tech. We remain always on, whether we're using a smartphone normally or, or we're relying on the self-management app. If you need an app to notify you that you're overusing your smartphone, think, think again. 
please don't give up on your own observational and social capabilities. There are plenty of social cues that you ought to be paying attention to. And don't give up on your social ties. Friends, family members, and coworkers, they will understand and hopefully join you. After all, you're going to need them if you want to deal with the social pressures. We need digital tech to be part of the solution, for example, by eliminating addictive design practices, shifting business models away from surveillance capitalism, and even engineering friction into some of our human-computer interfaces to slow things down so we can stop and think. But outsourcing Luddism to the digital tech industry is an oxymoron. We need Luddism to thrive, but it depends on how we engineer our built environment and whether we sustain our freedom to be off. Always on digital tech puts that freedom in general and Luddism in particular at risk. All right, so what to do? The book has a, has a ton of different things. Some of this is very abstract and takes a long time to explain, so I, I will skip that. For now, I'm happy to go into it if people are interested. And I'll skip this too. We have different categories of strategies like you know, creating air gaps and incompatibilities between smarts, like my smart home and my smart transportation system really don't need to talk to each other. <laughs> my smart toaster, my smart car, there's really no real gains in joint intelligence. <laughs> but there's a bunch of things like that. Things like the net neutrality rule, if you know about net neutrality, the open internet, the rule, it's a debate that's been going on for over a decade, back and forth. You know, the Obama administration's 2015 order for the open internet was recently sort of re-vacated by the Trump FCC. Um, in the book and elsewhere, I've argued about why these network neutrality rules or non-discrimination rules are both important in the context of our smart techno-social system, but we're going to revisit this debate over and over again for every smart system. The smart grid, your smart city, uh, smart transportation, smart internet, smart communications. It's the same question. You're going to revisit this, do we want it to be open or do we want to have, how smart should our infrastructures be? Um, and then you know, we have other things like engineering transactions. So these are all relatively sort of high level things. Let me just jump into some more practical, like engineering friction so we can slow down, stop and think, interact meaningfully, practice and develop capabilities to essentially human flourishing. Right? There's sort of a, we fetishize or worship at the altar of minimizing transaction costs, seamless transactions, interconnection. Sometimes it's actually worth slowing things down. Uh, we should, you should critically, this is another Scientific American piece on this recent, uh, you should critically question tech boosterism. Every time, every time you hear someone say blah, 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 blah in the cloud, you're going to save your photo, you're going to save your data, you can do your store blah, 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 in the cloud, you should say, you mean on someone else's computer? <laughs> Whose computer? Who owns it? Who gets access to it? How secure is it? A whole bunch of questions you can ask. But the cloud is a distorting metaphor that's incredibly powerful for distorting how people understand what's going on. It black boxes all of the bunch of complicated stuff. Is that, there's a bunch of stuff going on in this black box. It's too complicated for you to understand. You don't really need to know. It doesn't really matter anyway, except it's not that complicated to understand, and it actually does matter. You, same thing with smart. Whenever someone says this smart, this smart, that smart toaster, you say supposedly smart, and then ask questions like, who gets what intelligence, and for what purpose? There are a whole bunch of other questions you can start asking. When people say that this content online is free, I get the free news, I get the free this, I get the free that. You know, Facebook is free. We don't pay for bull, lo baloney, baloney. That's the word I'm looking for. Baloney. Replace free with paid for data, attention, and even your mind. There's a bunch of ways that the, just the discourse that we have about technology is captured by sort of booster tech boosterism and marketing slogans. But they're powerful because they shape the world we're building. I'm probably getting close to my time. You can always tell me to shut up and go to Q&A. But two more little ones. You can do practice Luddism. Try it. We can all do it. And then politically, you know, fight for the freedom to be off. Leave room for Luddites. Think, think about sort of where in, in, in there, there, I mean, whether it's fighting for net, an open internet, net neutrality rules, non-discrimination rules whether it's thinking about privacy rules that, uh, that get in the way of 
data collection on large platforms. There's a, ho there's a host of areas where we need some more breathing room um, and we can fight for those things. Um, I think that's, oh, that's, yeah. So thanks, I have a website, Reengineering Humanity Commons, check it out. I have a bunch of short essays you might like. Follow me on Twitter if that's your thing, because hey, I want to get you in my always on environment. No. Uh, but you know, one of the things is you know, spread the word, review, you know, review the book, those are all the kinds of things. I'm PA Voter Information Network. It's a game changer. Welcome to PA Voter Information Network. This is Larry DiMarco, your host.